Again, welcome to the Art of Resilience, Food Waste and Composting 2020 Speaker Series. Um, my name is Ryan Erke. I am the Sustainability Facilitator at the College of St. Scholastica. Uh, your other host today is Jana Corpi, who is at the um, University of Minnesota Duluth, working in the Office of Sustainability. Today, we are joined by three different speakers, and um, they'll be introducing themselves shortly, but just wanted to Again, welcome you to the Food Waste and Composting session. My name is Ryan. Today, our format will be um, some introductions and uh, kind of the topic and why this topic is important um, for us. We're gonna allow our speakers to provide their different perspectives, um, introducing themselves and their roles with food waste and composting, both locally here in the Twin Ports. And then we do have a representative from over in Vermont uh, to, to talk about further policy issues related to food waste and composting. After that point, we'll have a time for some questions that you can answer uh, or ask rather, and you can choose to ask them a couple different ways. Um, you can put them in the chat, we'll be monitoring the chat and we may not get to all those questions, but we'll do our best to get to some of the questions that we're there. And if there's some that keep on coming up that we aren't able to get to at that moment, we'll provide opportunities to connect with you later at a later point. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, again, it's the Art of Resilience 2020 Speaker Series, and I'm gonna hand it off to Jana here to kind of frame our conversation today. Jana? And you're on mute right now. Just gonna get my screen up here. And you can all hear my 10 month old in the background. That's Francis. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, like Ryan said, I am Jonna Corpy and I serve as the sustainability coordinator for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, so Ryan's kind of covered most of the housekeeping topics. Um, and I believe he did mention this is being recorded just for um, future use and review. Um, and then panel style questions. So please make sure you're asking questions. We'll try to ask them as they come up um, and do our best with that. So framing today's conversation. One second. Um, so what do food waste and composting have to do with sustainability? Um, it's a lot really, it's a big piece of the system. Approximately one third of all food in the US each year is not eaten. There are losses during harvest and transport, as well as waste from excess and spoilage. And then there's the consumer and retail level. So about 41 million tons of food waste is generated, was generated in 2017 um, from the household and retail level. Um, only 7% was composted and kept out of the landfill. And all the while, there are many people, um, one out of seven actually in this country, that don't have enough, enough to eat or don't know where their next meal is coming from. So that was a lot of stats. Let's quickly dig into those. Um, so remembering that in order to have a just, equitable, and sustainable society, there needs to be a healthy environment in which people have what they need to flourish, not just now, but also into the future. So environmental impacts are most apparent when you think about the 38 million tons of food waste that's ending up in landfills each year. 20, it's 21% of all landfill material in the United States. The way that food breaks down in a landfill creates methane, greenhouse gas that's 21 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. And this affects air quality and public health and it's an environmental justice issue. Communities of color and poor folks disproportionately are more likely to have a landfill site near their homes. We also waste the resources that went into growing our food water, soil, energy, fertilizer. And then there's the labor that went into growing and harvesting food. Often the people who put food on our tables are migrant farm workers, undocumented or on guest visas, and they work for low wages, few health protections, which often limits their own ability to afford the fresh produce or other products that they work so hard to process every day. And with COVID, um, there's a whole other host of, of um, issues that the folks that are feeding us are facing. So all this waste and then operating and maintaining landfills costs a lot of money. So that's a lot of 
stuff in a nutshell, but what can be done? There's lots that can be done. Um, there's a great um, visual here from the EPA called the food, food Recovery Hierarchy, and it lays out a great order of operations when it comes to reducing food waste. And shocker, composting is not at the top of the list. Um, so we want to talk about real quickly about the other options. So in order, you want to reduce the amount of excess, excess or waste generated. You want to feed people through donations. You want to feed animals. Um, moving into industrial uses, you can recycle like waste cooking oil um, at, a, at a larger level. Then it's compost. And at, at the very last option is landfill or incineration. So this is great for an organization like UMD or St. Scholastica. Um, but often at the household level, it's either reduce your waste and excess and then compost. There's not necessarily those, those middle things um, going on. So what does composting achieve? It keeps food waste out of landfills, reducing methane emissions and extending the life of the landfill. Might also reduce your trash bill. So you could downgrade to a smaller bin or bi-weekly service um, when you're creating less trash. Uh, it also creates a nutrient-rich, valuable product that can be used by community members and farmers um, to put nutrients back into the soil. So we could go into much more depth in all of these areas, um, but today we're here to talk about action and getting more people to know about how to manage their food waste through composting. Um, so with that, I will put up our second poll. Let me just get out of my screen sharing real quick um, because we wanna get a really quick Um, picture of people's experience uh, or what they're doing with their food waste in their household. So if you could go ahead and fill out the poll, that would be great. Okay, almost there. All right, okay, so we're gonna share these results. Um, so about half of the folks in the audience today, um, their food waste goes in the trash. Um, got a couple composters, home composters, a drop off and some on-campus composters. Awesome. So that gives a, us a better picture of who's in the audience today. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Ryan to start our conversation with our wonderful guests. All right, thank you, Jana. Um, I wanna thank you again, everyone, for attending. We have some featured speakers today. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. We do have a third featured speaker that um, has called in too, and so hopefully we'll be able to connect with Ellen here shortly. But to start off with, um, Sarah, and then following uh, the rest of you as well. Sarah, can you start and just take uh, maybe about five minutes to share about who you are, what your role is, and um, yeah, any other questions or thoughts you might want to share? And then at that point, um, we'll probably hand it over to Carl. And if we've connected with Ellen at that point, we'll let you know, and then we'll reach out to Ellen. Great. Thanks, Ryan. My name is Sarah Lerrell. I'm an environmental program coordinator at the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District in Duluth, Minnesota. So um, at WLSSD, we are the boss of two different things in our community, the boss of wastewater. So we have wastewater flowing in the pipes from drains and sinks, and it comes to our treatment plant to be treated. Um, but then our second and more kind of to the point um, job here is the the authority for solid waste. So in the state of Minnesota, most other solid waste authorities are the county where you live, or maybe if you um, grew up or, or have a hometown, um, the boss of trash in that community is typically the county. But in our area here, or the 500 square miles around Duluth, um, it's the sanitary district. So part of my role there doing outreach and education is uh, helping to talk about our compost programs and our programs that we uh, have implemented to both support the uh, statewide ban on yard waste and organic things in the trash. Um, Jana touched on all of those reasons why we want to keep um, good organic stuff out of the landfill. In our region, we do landfill all of our waste. So 
um, keeping the food and organic component out of there is a really important aspect that we can all do to, to make a difference with, for our climate and some other things. Um, and then uh, the job is pretty varied. A lot of outreach and education about our compost site that we operate. We take food scraps from the community. We mix it with yard scraps from the community. So like leaves and sticks. Um, we mix it up using large equipment and put it on um, air and then we produce garden green compost. It's a premium compost uh, that's made locally with our food scraps and then sold locally as well. So um, those are some of the things that we do uh, as outreach and education. We do tours and talking on panels and tons. Back in the old days, we used to do tons of outreach um, where we would physically be at a farmer's market or, or harvest festivals, um, different events where we would talk about what you can do um, in our area. I should say too, we don't just serve Duluth. Um, we serve 17 communities all together. So sometimes it can be real local when we're talking um, about our, your options, but certainly we can always clarify. Uh, and we'll talk, I think, as we go on about the options that folks have to participate locally um, in, our, in our landscape of trying to keep the good stuff out of the landfill. Great, thank you, Sarah, for that, that time. Um, I do believe we have Ellen on the phone here now and stuff. Um, Ellen, if you have a chance here, John, are you able to unmute Ellen and put her on the phone here? Um, to have, give it a shot. Hello, Ellen, is that you there? It's me. I was muted for some reason. Yeah, well, we are controlling you from afar, but we are inviting um, people here to introduce themselves. If you want to take up to five minutes to share who you are and how you're involved with composting and kind of how you got involved with this work, that would be great. And I'll cut you off if you go too long. I have your picture up. Okay. I'm going to put it up right now. Okay. Um, my name is Ellen Sandbeck. Um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and started doing organic landscaping with my husband in, ooh, 1981 and basically self-taught did I just hang up hello no we hear you <sighs> okay something weird happened with my phone okay um then we moved to to uh, Duluth because I have relatives here and we couldn't afford California because we're not good at money and I got really upset at not being able to compost because even in the summer, when I put any kind of food waste outside, it would get scattered all over the neighborhood every night by all kinds of varmints. So after a couple of years, I finally bought some composting worms, which had no instructions whatsoever, except for open container of worms, tip worms into bin. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I basically just learned by doing and, um, I guess I'm a person who's not afraid to make mistakes. I figured that's the only way I can learn anything. So I just tried all kinds of things. And then um, people started asking me for worms and I had to increase the number of bins I had in order to give away worms. And I finally realized I was spending a lot of time and money so I could grow worms, so I could give worms to people who I not only didn't know, I didn't know anybody they knew. And then I realized it was a business. Um, and because I'm mo always more than happy to do troubleshooting with, with customers and even actually with people who've never bought worms from me, um, I've learned a whole lot because it's very hard for one person to come up with lots and lots of new mistakes to make constantly. Eventually, you kind of run out of new mistakes to make. But luckily for me, people will call me and ask me questions and they've made all kinds of mistakes I would never have come up with. So I've I've learned over a period of 30 plus years, a huge amount from other people. And I also am the, the worm farm specialist at the, the uh, federal prison camp in Hermantown here. Um, so I help train inmates how to do large scale vermicomposting, which is really, really exciting because I, I get, people who are really interested in learning it and taking it back to their neighborhoods when they get out. So they're all excited about it. So 
that's pretty fun. Unfortunately, I'm on furlough now because there's such a problem with coronavirus in prisons, but I'm hoping I'll be able to get back there eventually. Is well, that is, good enough for an interview? Yeah, this is all great, Ellen. Thank you so much for joining us and making the, the phone call and navigating that. We'll get back to you and um, Sarah with other questions, but before we do, I want to give an opportunity for Carl to share some stuff about what he's doing here and uh, kind of his role um, that he's had, different roles he's had. So Carl, I'll hand it off to you. You're currently muted and I know you want to share your screen too. So you think you're good to go. Awesome. Thanks for having me, folks. It's really great to be here. And uh, yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Oh, that's the email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the pictures, the good stuff. So I will, just a quick thing about me, I'm, uh, I live in a tiny house and I try and reduce my uh, consumption in a lot of ways of all kinds of resources, but also uh, produce good things um, because I really appreciate the idea of uh, a production culture as opposed to a consumption one. And composting is something that we can all do to make that happen. Um, I also love just being outdoors and uh, kayaking and fun stuff like that. And so more on composting, like actually a lot of folks call me Compost Carl. Uh, I got that nickname kind of in high school. I started the composting program in uh, Asheville, North Carolina at high school there. And I wrote a song and it just caught on with the whole nickname and I've carried it with me for many years now. Um, and then I went to Green Mountain College and uh, on the right picture is where I'm working with the compost system there. And Simon James, a good friend, and Ryan Erke was part of the sustainability office there as well. So that's how we are connected. Um, but yeah, I've always had a fascination with uh, what we call waste uh, or resources that people are throwing away uh, to get rid of when a lot of it is so useful in many ways. Um, so that's kind of my life goal is to wrap my head around that and um, change it. But uh, so at my, during my time at Green Mountain College, I started a internship with the Rutland County Solid Waste District and I was doing outreach with them for a summer and it was in the middle of uh, when the Vermont food scrap ban started uh, or the universal recycling law it's known as officially. So in 2012, that law was passed uh, and this is a really rough outline, but July 1st of 2014, it required large commercial generators to divert food scraps from the trash and then um, phased into lower thresholds of food scrap generators as well. Uh, 2015, recycling was banned from the trash. 2016, leaf and yard debris. And that's for everyone in the state, including residents for both of those. And then in 2017, small restaurants had to divert food scraps from the trash. And now this year, uh, July 1st of 2020, everyone in the state is required to deal with food in other ways. So that could be uh, reducing how much you consume or uh, produce in the first place and that whole food recovery hierarchy that Chana showed. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I loved working with the Solid Waste District there. And, uh, and then my final year at Green Mountain College, I did a senior project on increasing the capacity, and that was in 2017. Uh, increasing the capacity of food scrap processing. So compost facilities, uh, what are the barriers to them starting up in our county in particular, and what are some opportunities to do so? And then, uh, yeah, since 2017, I was the outreach coordinator uh, part-time and then full-time started this year. Um, and the, the craziest thing about this year um, was really just that we weren't able to do in-person outreach uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic. And so it made it a bit more challenging to reach residents as well, because 
a lot of the, you know, I did events like Sarah as well. Um, but we had a really awesome turnout with like Zoom meetings. So that was a cool, uh, I guess, flip side of the coin there. Um, and the other really difficult part about this year was um, requiring everyone to ban uh, divert food scraps from the trash was especially hard for multifamily residential units. So especially in a city um, when there's a really crowded residential area, um, it's really limited to either trying to offer collection to remove it offsite or maybe vermicomposting would be really awesome, but that's a little trickier for many people to grasp. Um, so for any future states that try to uh, ban food from the trash, I really recommend planning out your multifamily residential uh, education and how to handle all that because we weren't so prepared for that this year um, until right before the food scrap ban went into effect. Um, and then the last thing is uh, just a fun picture. I <laughs> was part of a project where we were trying to show how much food is being wasted. And uh, we did that by getting it dumped on our heads. People were uh, entered into a raffle to be the ones dumping it on us. And uh, as long as they clean their plate off. And then um, the weirdest thing I've ever tried to compost, uh, it's well like composting poop and urine uh, together, mixing it, it, does, it doesn't work that well. So I'd recommend trying to separate as much as possible. And then uh, at Green Mountain College, the weirdest thing I saw in the compost was a Jägermeister t-shirt. I don't know how I got there, but <laughs> I actually reclaimed it and uh, washed it and wore it later. <laughs> And that's about it for me for now. I'd happily answer more questions later. So thanks for watching. Oh my goodness, this is so great. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation since you all have such a variety of experience and are coming to this work from different perspectives. Um, so the next question, we're gonna start you off with an easy one. We'll kind of do a, a round robin so you can jump in and answer as you like. Um, what are the basics that somebody might need to know in order to start composting? Um, like if they can do it at home or if they can't do it at home, what do they need? Want me to start, Jana? Sure, Ellen. <laughs> oh, it's Sarah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I saw Ellen's uh, thing was lit up. That's all right. Um, again, I'm Sarah from Duluth, the WLSSD, and if you are interested in getting uh, started in composting or just uh, saving food scraps from the landfill, there are several ways you can do that. Um, the, you're probably already doing it, whether you know it or not. The first one is that all of the communities in the WLSSD have ordinances or little rules and laws about um, how they allow composting in their communities. So for the most part, most of our, our communities um, are fine with compost bins and we encourage you to do that. We have lots of information available and we do lots of in-person coaching on outdoor compost bins. Um, so that is a great way that if you are a homeowner, especially it's much easier to do that way. Um, then the second way that you can get involved um, it, as far as what WLSSD offers is uh, we have a mandate, a rule. Since 2006, we've required all producers of food scraps businesses um, to beneficially reuse their food scraps. So our first preference is, of course, to feed people. Then if you can't do that, you can feed animals. And if you can't do that, then, you know, the hierarchy says bring it to us at the, the compost site. Um, so if you eat out in a Duluth area, including at College of St. Scholastica or the University of Minnesota at Duluth, those um, institutions are required to uh, separate food scraps pre-consumer before they come out to you before the food is served. So things like scraps and rinds and peelings and that sort of thing are all composted. Um, a private hauler will pick that up from the business and bring it to our Yardway site down at 27th Avenue West. We mix it with leaves that the state of Minnesota requires all residents and businesses um, to keep out of the landfill. Um, and uh, we mix them together to make the compost there. Uh, and then 
lastly, if you are a resident of um, the WLSSD and you aren't able to compost your own um, and you want to use our food scrap drop sites, that is one of the first programs in the country to offer drop sites around the community, which are basically dumpsters. And you can bring anything that is or was alive, um, you know, food scrap wise. Uh, and I mean, we have some rules around that. <laughs> yeah, our hunting season can get a little dicey, um, but uh, you can bring your food to our, our food scrap drop sites. We have eight of them throughout the Duluth community primarily, um, and a few more in, in Carleton County. Um, and then we will collect those for you. So we just ask that uh, folks have follow the rules, put it in a compostable bag, make sure it is or was edible, um, and then drop it off for us. So those are kind of in a nutshell, those are the things that we have um, going on. I'll happily share a little, unless Ellen wants to go. Um, yeah, I'll go. All right, go for it, Ellen. Okay. Um, so vermicomposting is um, a method of composting that allows you to compost a much smaller volume than you can doing sort of standard composting. You can actually compost very efficiently in a 27 gallon bin with worms in it. And I have, because I'm the sort of person who has to test everything, um, after I had had worm bins for a year or so, I thought, well, is it just composting or are the worms actually doing anything? So I set up a worm bin ex exactly the same way that I normally did and fed it exactly the same way I normally would, except I didn't put any worms in it. And I learned very quickly that you cannot compost without worms in a 27 gallon bin. It just does not work. So the worms actually are quite essential to the process. So, so in other words, if you want to be able to compost your own food from just your own household indoors conveniently in the winter, um, the, pretty much the only way you really can do that is with vermicomposting because you can do it in a small bin. I actually had a ballet dancer in Chicago who had a worm bin that she brought from here and she had it under her bed in her apartment and it worked just fine. And my son, when he was in graduate school, had a worm bin on a rack in his uh, kitchen and that worked just fine. Um, you can also scale it up much bigger. The, the worm bin at the prison is 100 feet long and it takes care of the waste from about 800 prisoners, 900 prisoners at most. Um, and it's very hands-on. There's no machinery involved, so it's very low tech. So it can be done, you know, all of the technology is, is in the design of the bin and between people's ears. So it, it can be passed along from person to person, which is a nice thing. So I've seen some very techy sort of uh, composting systems. And when the person who invented them goes away, then usually the whole system falls apart. Vermicomposting is because the worms really know what they're doing. If you give them what they need in the right environment, they'll just keep doing it. And a very large system like the one at the prison has a huge amount of momentum. So it, it's actually pretty hard to mess it up. Um, I also do, I run the worm bins at, at Stowe Elementary School and we feed those all the food waste from the school and feeding waste from a school is kind of um, illuminating because you can see which foods the children don't like and you can see the consequences of the people in the kitchen not paying attention to what their job actually is which in my opinion is the kitchen staff's job is to help make sure those children get well nourished and if you give a kindergartner or a sec who has a very small mouth because it's a small child, or say a second grader who has very few front teeth, a whole apple, that apple may end up being punctured a couple times, but it's not going to get eaten. So they, those things need to be cut up. So a lot of waste, especially when it's, you know, children being fed, a lot of waste has to do with not paying attention to what the children actually need. And as far as um, reusing, you know, getting food 
to humans who need it. Um, in the summer, in order to f feed the worms at, at the school, I go to the supermarkets and, and get food waste you know, from the produce department, although I'm not able to do that right now, but usually I do that. And a lot of times there's perfectly edible food in there, even though they do separate out for um, food kitchens. Um, but I've eaten stuff out of the <laughs> what they've thrown away in, in the uh, produce department because I can't stand the idea of wasting food. Um, let's see. Oh, and as far as uh, <laughs> hunting season goes, the weirdest thing I've ever composted at the school was a deer head. Um, somebody put it in the bin to have it have the worms clean off the, the meat and which was would have been nicer if they'd like warned me or asked me first but they didn't but it took about two months to to clean the, the deer deer skull of all of the the meat and the hair ellen what type of worms are they uh icenia fetida red wigglers red wigglers perfect mm -hmm. and i've i've um been a consultant for people who have livestock you know they've asked whether they if they could compost their dead sheep or their dead cows so I'll, i will walk them through the process of how to do it um because it's a very efficient way of getting rid of flesh <laughs> compared to a lot of other ways um also of um let's see what year was it 2017 my husband and i got invited to go to vietnam to um potentially work with a businessman there on a vermicomposting project, which didn't go through because we could not get the right worms at the time, but um, apparently there's some some interest again. So I'm hoping to go back to Vietnam. Um, and in 2016, we went to China to visit our daughter who was working there. And China compared to the US is very interesting as far as food goes because um, even in the city, even in Shanghai, every square inch that wasn't being used for something else, that somebody was growing food that somewhere. When we stayed in a um, bed and breakfast in Anhui province, the, the um, building had a very small amount of land and the, all of the food that we ate in that bed and breakfast was grown within, literally within about 10 yards of the house, all the way around the house. Um, so I have a fantasy of going back to China, going to Shanghai and working with the people who uh, do the recycling for the, the big um, residential buildings that are multi-storied, say 18, 20 stories. They're just, that's pretty much the only kind of housing that most people are living in in Shanghai. Um, because on the bottom of each of those buildings, there are people who do all the recycling for the whole building. They they sort through all of the trash that everybody throws away and they take out the recyclables and the, and they sell the the metal and um, whatever else they can sell but i'm thinking if i could help them set up vermicomposting systems in the bottom of each of those um, apartment buildings it would not only keep food waste out of their waste stream but it also give them another stream of income so I, that could keep me busy for the rest of my life if I could get in, in on that, but it would be pretty fun. That's awesome, Helen. Thanks for sharing. I, I'll just add briefly to the how to handle food scraps ideas. Um, make it convenient for yourself. Don't try and uh, create an elaborate system all at once if you don't have much experience with it. Um, and you know, like if it's going to be a hundred yards away in your backyard in the winter, you're probably not going to want to go out there when it's super deep snow. But, um, and then consider your goals. Like, are you trying to build up soil to use for yourself or to give away? Um, or would you rather just divert your food scraps uh, without having to worry about it? Um, and if that's the case, a lot of folks will in Vermont just stick their food in a bag or in a bucket in the fridge or a freezer 
and then dump it right into the uh, removal pail for either the transfer station, drop off site, or if they get it picked up at their house or business. So, um, and then in general on a systems level, I think um, industrial composting does have a really important place in diverting food scraps from the trash, but really home composting and worm composting, uh, everything we can do locally is gonna be much more beneficial for our local food system beyond just reducing our impact. It's gonna make a positive impact in other ways. So I encourage that as much as possible. This is all great. I'm enjoying this a lot here. Um, before we move on from this kind of what to do with compost, uh, I wanna make a point, especially for students who happen to live on campus or spend a lot of time on our respective campuses, either at the College of St. Scholastica or the University of Minnesota Duluth, know where to compost. So um, Sarah mentioned this already, that both of our food services are required um, to compost, um, provide compost uh, stream or a place to put your food waste. So in um, at the College of St. Scholastica in the Greenview Dining Room, or in Stormsden, there is a specific space right where uh, any other, like your plates are put or your trash and recycling are put in Stormsden where it says compost and that's where you put your food waste in. Um, they also have a spot just outside of Greenview Din Dining Hall and Summers Hall, a green bin underneath the stairs where anyone who's not on the meal plan or if you have food waste from um, not on the meal plan, say you're living in the apartments on campus that so you can put your food waste there. It can only handle, you know, a, a small amount of food waste. It can't probably handle as much as we generated in a typical household. And if you either don't live on campus, you're generating um, more than the, you know, a, a small bin can handle. You should be taking it to the, the drop-off sites. And we did put a link into the chat where those drop-off sites are. Um, that's where I use, uh, I use the Concordia Lutheran Church drop-off site over in the Woodland area. And it's great, super convenient. And there's a number, another number of other drop-off locations in and around both of our campuses. Johnna, do you want to mention where um, at UMD you can compost your items? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, throughout the academic buildings, there should be at least one compost bin in every academic building, if not multiples. They're typically placed with their recycling bin and the trash. So you can dispose of any item that you've got in a really easy way. Um, they're green bins, so they're easy to spot. Um, also in the residence halls, there are, I think, eight different spots in different trash rooms that have compost um, compost bin collection. And then if you live in the apartments at UMD, um, each apartment complex has a compost bin next to their dumpster. It is a small bin and it gets confused a lot as just another garbage. Um, but if you want to start composting, we're trying to make it much more um, visible and actually harder for people to just throw garbage into it so that it doesn't get um, contaminated. So those um, spots are really accessible and um, it shouldn't be a barrier, hopefully, for anybody to, that wants to participate in composting on campus. Great. So we have some questions that come through the chat, which have been great. I'm going to um, kind of curate these or at least try to um, pitch them out to uh, our panelists here. So. The first one that came up, and I think this is a consideration that I experienced too. So I might be, you know, I have composted in the past in different communities at home, but I'm in a little bit hesitant to do so here in Duluth um, because when we moved here, the bears were getting into the garbage in our neighborhood and stuff. Um, and so I, at least in talking to each of the panelists in the past, I know that there's different takes on how to address this or how to, what you might want to consider. But the question came out, how do you make the compost beast proof if living very close to wildlife? What sort of options do you have if you want to um, either do a fully compost or even collecting your and managing your food waste before you just take the drop off site? Um, maybe Ellen, um, since you're on the phone, I'm gonna pitch this to you. What sort of recommendations do you have about food waste and management when you're in a, a space where there's a lot of wildlife around? Well, that's exactly why I started doing vermicomposting indoors because I couldn't compost outside because everything got, you know, scattered all over the yard every night. Even if I didn't put anything obvious in there, like there was no bread, there was no cheese, there was no meat, it was just vegetable and fruit scraps and it still got scattered everywhere every night. So, you know, if you do it inside, the bears are not going to come inside to, to get your food scraps. 
Great. Okay. So, Sarah, um, would you be up for taking any advice you got for people or maybe even how you guys manage it within your sites too? Sure. Yeah, it, that is a huge issue with urban composting. And in Duluth, you'll have uh, uh, varmints of all sizes. So another, in addition to the bears, um, we have a lot of urban rats. That's just all there is to it. So um, I think Ellen mentioned what you're putting into your compost is key. So if you would like to to give it a whirl, um, just understand, of course, that there, nothing is going to keep a bear out. Um, so you you need to temper your expectations a little bit there. Um, but by putting things that have less odor and less um, kind of grossness as they decay, sometimes you can reduce the odors and, and keep pests away. So when you're putting food in, she said to avoid things like bread, oils, and cheese. And we would also, but exactly, don't put those sorts of items, just do vegetative waste in your backyard compost. Every time that you add uh, material to a backyard compost pile, um, like the nitrogen containing back, uh, material, like the food, you've got to put at least an equal amount of carbon on top of it. So leaves, so make sure that you are putting the leaves down. That's gonna help both keep the flies away and from laying uh, eggs in there and producing maggots, but then also um, it helps to bring the odors down to keep those critters out of your bin. So those are really like big things that help um, with, with pests, but there's almost no guarantee in our community that you will have a pest-free compost. Carl, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I'm trying to pull it up actually to put a link in shortly, uh, but the, with Vermont, we did start to do suggestions for uh, bear proofing and the best we could get was either um, an electric fence and even baiting it, uh, like putting peanut butter on it so that the bear would get a zap and then not want to come back, uh, or putting down, um, we call them unwelcome mats, <laughs> so uh, like plywood with screws sticking up out of it. Um, and this is probably over the top for most cases, as long as you're composting with plenty of brown materials like the leaves and carbon materials, uh, it should deter or not attract things as much. But um, if it's a, you just gotta make it so it's not worth the effort for the bear to actually come and get the food scraps. So uh, if you wanna go that route, it's possible. Electric fences can be costly, um, but otherwise, yeah, just sealing off the bin as well as you can from uh, rodents and smaller wildlife will be pretty effective for the most part. And then there's another kind of technology called a green cone that's a digester. So you're dropping food scraps in and it's a cone on top and then it's partially buried in the ground and it helps either worms or other uh, microbes will help break it down uh, and uh, turn it into liquid and disperse it throughout the soil. Uh, I know that can be effective because it's well sealed and it's harder for bears and wildlife to get in there and it doesn't create the odor. Um, so that's just another option is to look into digesters. You can also try and make your own. Um, so that's my best and I'll try and post our link to the bear stuff soon. All right, our next question question um, is going to be asked live. Martha, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask your question. Okay, um, I don't have a question, but uh, I think um, Carl kind of covered it. Um, I used to keep bees, so if you put a baited uh, solar electric fence around just like you around your compost bin, just like you would with bees. Uh, I think that would do it. And we use bacon to bait our bears so they would get a little bit of a zap. And um, I would think that would probably work for raccoons too because I never had problems with raccoons and they love bee larvae. So um, yeah, that's all I wanna say. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we've had two questions that I, I kinda wanna combine. Um, for you folks. Um, one is specifically about worms and whether or not you need a specific type of worm to eat meat. 
Um, but the broader question is, how do you know what's comp compostable and what's not compostable? Um, somebody was asking, because they've been told that certain things you can't compost, um, but was never told specifically what those things were. So kind of a two part question, what to compost, what not to compost, and are there special meat eating worms? Should I just jump in on that since it's partly <laughs> sure. about worms? Sure. Okay, um, the worms that, the, the species that I grow and sell, Icenia fetida, um, researchers have tested a lot of different species of worms. They obviously haven't tested all species of worms. And Icenia fetida was, turned out to be the most efficient at vermicomposting. Um, they have kind of a wide temperature range they can um, be efficient at, and they have a wide range of food they, they can eat, and they're not flighty. In other words, um, there are some species of worms that are used for vermicomposting, and I've read about them, and if, if, <laughs> if there's like a loud clap of thunder near enough to the worms, they will all leave the bin. Um, <laughs> which makes them pretty unsuitable for worm composting, if you ask me. Um, Icenia fetida will eat pretty much anything that, that used to be alive. So I have fed my worms mm, old jeans, old t-shirts, leather boots. Uh, right now they're eating my cowboy hat, which is like 30 years old. Um, uh, let's see. There was the deer head. I've had people I've consulted with who've done dead sheep, dead cows. Um, the only things that I don't recommend for indoor composting are um, hay and grass because there's a tiny little fly. I don't actually know what it's what species it is, but it's the size and shape and color of a hyphen on a page. And they are always, always, always mating. They, their eggs must be in such enormous quantities on anything in the grass family that if you put it in your worm compost bin in your basement, you will get enough of those flies to black out your basement windows. So no grass, no hay. And generally, I tell people to not put anything in their bin that is, has got a lot of salt in it because the salt will build up in the compost and it'll be basically salting your garden when you use the compost. And also not to be, not to use any leaves for bedding that have been in a garden that's had a lot of herbicide or pesticide use because worms are very um, sensitive to chemicals. And if, if you insist on feeding them something that has a lot of preservatives and or is difficult to digest, for instance, um, French fries, be prepared for whatever that is to take a very long time to break down. Um, at Stowe Elementary, we once got um, a couple of five gallon buckets of French fries the kids hadn't eaten. And knowing that the French fries are supposed to be hard to digest, I thought, well, they might be hard for the worms as well. So I, I did them in a two French fry layer over the, the several different bins just so I didn't have a big mass of french fries. And when I went in a week later, the french fries had basically turned into a really good um, imitation of particle board. It was like glued together. <laughs> and the kids looked at that. And said, I am never eating french fries again. <laughs> and, and, and they did take a long time to break down. So anything that's like not considered very healthy food is going to take a longer time for the worms to break down. So um, if you have a small bin, you probably don't want to feed that at all. If you're running a 100-foot long bin, you can use do a little bit of it, but not a lot of it in one area. Um, was there something else I was supposed to answer that, I didn't, that I've forgotten already? No, that's pretty solid. OK. All right, Carl or Sarah, you want to jump in? Uh, it looks like Ryan has shared uh, the list of what our industrial composting site will take. So it's basically anything that was or is alive. Um, and then there are a few kind of other things as well. So um, one thing I wanted to touch on in our large scale piles and when folks from the public are using drop sites, we don't necessarily want um, fabrics and things like that. Although they are compostable, um, we find that there are very few 100% cotton items anymore. And so um, 
uh, that would be one thing from our industrial site anyway that we would urge caution. Do you want to talk about pizza boxes, Sarah? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so across the state of Minnesota, there are a lot of different compost sites and a lot of different sites accept different things. We have rules at our site that just make it real simple for folks. Like um, if it has a BPI, a Biodegradable Products Institute logo on it, we would love to compost it for you. Um, but in the case of pizza boxes in our community, because we have a wide variety of pizza boxes that come and are coated in with a lot of different things, we would like you to tear off anything that's not greasy and put it in the recycle bin and then anything that is grease soaked put put in the trash so um, we have a lot of products in our community that have plastic coatings that even if they look waxy or whatever but they're just not so um, bpi certified food packaging is great otherwise try to recycle it or not use it at all and for those folks on the call that are at UMD, all of our coffee cups are BPI certified. Our, most of the products that we serve in the food court um, are BPI certified. So keep an eye out for that little logo. It's a little green circle um, with arrows. Carl, anything to add? Yeah, only thing I'd add is trust your solid waste authority because a lot of people think they know what is supposed to be composted and they might just be getting rumors. Um, and Preach then, it, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like trust Sarah in this case. And uh, there in Vermont, there's a lot of private haulers picking up food scraps now. And they kind of have different ideas. Um, but then where it ends up is usually uh, you got to trust the solid waste authority on that. So that's all I'll say. Um, so these have been, this has been great. I'm going to um, close with this last question here um, for each of you. And then we'll have some time um, for anyone else who wants to stick around if there's any other questions come up, but this is kind of, and we'll share a little bit more, but the, um, in terms of the chat and stuff like that, we won't be taking probably any more additional questions at this time. Um, but uh, the, the second question that John and I talked about in preparing for this presentation was, what are each of you doing or have each of you done in different ways in your food waste or composting roles to address injustice in your communities and to advance equity and inclusion? Does that play into the roles that you've done? And if so, how have you done that? And uh, if it's all right, we're going to also just hand it off to Ellen for being she's on the phone. It's a little bit easier to kind of hand it off to her so you know where to hop in. Ellen, do you have any thoughts on this about what, what roles and how um, food waste and composting can help um, address injustice? Well, I guess because um, the school where I run the worm bins is a very low income school. I mean, the children come from very low income families and they're able to sell the worm um, leachate, which I call worm juice, other people call other things. Um, for fundraising, that helps a lot. Um, and I set up a large worm bin at ACO, um, and the kids who live there have also been selling um, the leachate um, for fundraising. And of course, the, the compost is used in the garden, which feeds the people who live at ACO. And um, when I'm working at the prison, a fairly large percentage of the inmates that I work with are from the inner city. A lot of them are actually from the Chicago area and almost a hundred percent of them want to go back and bring their, their knowledge back to their neighborhood and, and set up worm composting systems and, and work with kids and gardens and stuff. So um, I, I guess that's how I'm dealing with that. Um, I'd like to do more of that, but you know, you do what you can. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing. Um, Sarah, Carl, you, either one of you want to go next here? 
Sure. And in our area, we would like to do better in a lot of different ways. Some of the things we do, um, we make sure that we do targeted outreach to our neighbors in our neighborhood. Uh, we use the farmer's markets as a place to kind of launch and do a lot of outreach and education there through downtown Harrison. There's a few different locations throughout the city. Um, so we try to meet folks where they're at and give a lot of free stuff and a lot of free education as well. So buckets and bags and things like that. Um, one of the things we're working on specifically in the upcoming years is actually with our hiring processes and um, looking to try to diversify our role in diversifying the field of compost um, creation and, and trying to really look at how we can get um, professionals of a greater diversity of backgrounds and be welcoming of, of all communities there. Um, and then lastly, the compost that we produce, we do have programs where uh, folks can apply to get grants. Um, and so we work closely with the Duluth Community Gardens that serve uh, folks of all different of economic backgrounds, but um, it's all over the city. And so we, we are an active partner there as well. Great, thanks for sharing, Sarah. Carl, how about you? Yeah, so, um, well, at Green Mountain College, the food recovery program was something I am really proud of that uh, food recovery or capturing the food that was being wasted to donate to other folks that would eat it. Um, the edible food that is. Um, so we were bringing it to a local senior center uh, and a local food shelf. So kind of benefiting folks that are uh, either in poverty or just not as well supported maybe disabled, have a harder time procuring nutritious food. And then, um, and that's a big part of what a lot of places in Vermont do is just donating it because it's free to get rid of or it doesn't cost um, and then it benefits folks. So I, I can't um, highlight that enough. The only concern with that is trying to avoid the overproduction of food, um, if it uh, is then going to folks that need it, which is great, but uh, trying to avoid, yeah, just that uh, reaction from that. And then uh, my current work that I didn't mention yet is, uh, since I left the solid waste district is, uh, I'm at Reclaimed Vermont, it's a makerspace community center in Pulteney where Green Mountain College was, and I'll post a link, but uh, we're, some of my goals are to really encourage and help folks learn and build these compost systems for their backyards or for the community and uh, being able to grow food as well from that. So empowering folks to have their own role in their food system is really important to, um, you know, rather than having to rely on the grocery stores that, um, yeah. So <laughs> that's something I'm trying to work on, work towards more. Um, and being a nonprofit, we uh, want to, yeah, benefit folks that don't, might not have the money to, build their own, go buy their own stuff. And we're trying to use materials that would otherwise be waste. Like, oh, there's so many pallets out here and then um, and rain barrels that once they're cracked, it's hard for folks to use it for rain, but you can turn it into a compost barrel. So um, things like that. Yeah, this is great. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. We are gonna start wrapping things up here. If there's anything that either Ellen or Sarah or Carl that didn't get mentioned that you really wanna highlight, um, give, we can give a few moments here for that prior to wrapping up. Um, uh, anything, Ellen, on your end? Yeah, I just remembered um, Stowe Elementary has a really amazing recycling system. It's not just the food waste, it's recycling in general. And years ago, the principal made a deal with the, the uh, school district that, they, that the school through recycling and they also have, they don't use disposable napkins, they wash napkins and they 
they have they don't have disposable flatware they they you know wash flatware um they save thousands of dollars a year and the school district allows them to keep that money so that money is used to send the kids on field trips so the kids don't have to pay for it because a lot of their families can't afford it so the kids are definitely benefiting in a lot of ways from the the whole recycling program and of course the not having to have heavy food waste hauled away is, is also, you know, a money saver too. Great. Thanks. For oh, sharing. and oh, yeah. every once in a while we will get something odd, like a whole box of untouched apples that are in perfect shape and, or <laughs> several, several boxes of, um, cauliflower or something like that. And we, we will redistribute that. You didn't hear that from me, <laughs> but anyway, we, we never just throw away edible food that's still in its original packaging. That would be terrible. So that food has been redistributed several times by us. That's great. Um, Sarah, Carl, if you have anything else you wanted to share before we start wrapping things up, this is your moment here, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, if folks um, are interested in some of the virtual options that we'll be offering this fall, we'll be doing some um, compost, how to compost basics, inspired in part by Carl's great success over in Vermont. I watched your videos. Uh, we'll be doing a couple of, of those um, kind of Facebook Live workshops that'll be available. Um, and so by following our Facebook page uh, and then just stopping into the WLCC website, uh, we've got just a ton of information and we're working hard to um, make things like tours of our site accessible to all here in this kind of new world that we're living in. Great. Carl? Um, I think that's that's a pretty good amount and uh, yeah never never lose your passion for learning more on this topic and always feel free to reach out with questions. It's I, I learn something new every day about composting still and especially being in educator like ellen said it's really awesome to learn from everyone else so don't don't be afraid to share your experience too and thanks for trying yeah well this has been a lot of fun everyone um we really have i've gained a lot too so thanks so much for making time for us here um i'm gonna hand this off to jonna here our contact information is below but jonna if you want to close this out here for the day Sure. Um, so just, yeah, thanks again for everybody that attended. Um, we will be having another series, um, another episode in the series on October 15th at 3 p.m. featuring um, April from Zero Waste Duluth. And we'll have some of our students sharing their zero waste strategies for how they get through their school days. Um, so we hope you join us for that. And um, we will be sending out follow-up emails with you know, copy of the recording and some of the resources that our speakers shared. Um, so keep an eye out for that if you need anything and you can reach out to Ryan or I with additional questions for our campuses. Yep. Thanks all and um, have a great, great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. Alan. Sarah, can I ask you a question about you mentioned in the beginning that restaurants have to divert food waste. Does every, does every larger, like do grocery stores have to? We had a dumpster diver come last year and he said he checked out some pretty good dumpsters in the Twin Ports area and they were yeah. full of food. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. So our ordinance actually um, covers very distinct um, kind of phases. So there are grocery stores with a square footage of I think it's 2000 square feet. So Target just just gets in there, um, like Walmart and then all the big grocery stores, they all have active programs. So Cub and the Super One Chains and that sort of thing. There are some smaller kind of bodega style ones that, or gas stations um, like Quick Trip, they don't make the threshold of square footage. So um, those would be ones that wouldn't be required. Okay, it was Aldi and Aldi's a little bit smaller. Oh, I gotta tell you. No, Aldi is required. Uh -oh. <laughs>
Um, they they're tricky. Uh, their corporate structure, um, and they have they actually have very little waste compared to the others, and so but it's it's been difficult. We have now two. There's one in Cloquet as well, and it's been difficult to um, to have follow through from the organization. I 100% concur with that. I also had a Aldi in Rutland that was not easy to, and they probably still aren't diverting food scraps yet, 100%. But, but yeah, they actually donate a lot of their food and uh, have a pretty awesome source reduction program, it seems. So that's good. Yeah. That's something that I'm always trying to get students to, to hit on and interview grocery stores and just highlight that they're doing these things and that it's happening. and. You know, get some positive press, but nobody's really shown much interest yet. <laughs> yeah, the grocery stores are really our greatest partner. And however you, as far as volumes, but and however you feel about Walmart, their sustainability policies in the last five years or so have really, um, they bring a lot of organic material to our site from across the whole northern tier because they're so large and they've got these stores that would otherwise never be served by a composting facility. Um, but they're bringing stuff from War Road and um, sites out, you know, Thief River, all these places, they, they have the resources to bring that together. So um, that's kind of neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, well, this has been, a, I think, you know, we've just done a couple of these, although I did a few of them last semester, too, but we've had a really great audience here. I see a few people are still sticking around, too, for this conversation, but um, I think what's been really wonderful is that we had a, a diversity of experiences, and I, for me, at least, food waste is really kind of just fun to talk about because it's kind of the mixture of I'm doing something good, and it's a little bit icky sometimes, and so that gets me excited, you know, like, oh, what's going on? I do have some students who are more interested in a little more deeper dive on um, specifically humanure. And so we, I've asked them if they want to do some more stuff. So I know, Carl, you just touched on that a little bit. Um, we might end up um, having some reach out about that, too. And they want to share some of their experiences with that, too. I know it's not everyone's um, interest in cup of tea, but um, I, I may be reaching out about that um, to all of you and kind of see what...